we'll probably get things started. It's 10 after 6. Don't want to hold you all up any, any longer. I want to thank you all very much for coming out this evening. I realize it's a 4th of July weekend, but uh, anyway, you are the diehards. We really appreciate it. Um, before we get before we uh, begin tonight, I, I want to uh, thank our sponsors of Solar Washington. We really appreciate your support. Your support allows us to do a variety of things, including holding meetings like this, doing outreach, uh, and other programs. So uh, thank you very much. If you're not a, a sponsor, uh, please do consider becoming one, and you can also become a member as an individual or professional in the field. Uh, so for more information, you can certainly see me um, any time during this meeting. Uh, actually, not during the meeting, but after the meeting. Yes, do we have a question? Students do get a discount. We, we do, however, uh, require three pieces of identification, including your Social Security number. No, I'm joking. Anyway. So um, after, after this meeting, we typically go to a bar. Um, but that uh, we have not established where we're going to go, so we can play it by ear after the meeting. So uh, we do have a number of uh, venues on Finney slash Greenwood Avenue that we can choose from. So um, we'll figure it out later on in the meeting, maybe after the meeting. So uh, tonight uh, we decided to throw the floor open to you all, giving your two cents in more or less three minutes. I will time you, but I won't, uh, I won't be draconian about it. So I do have, welcome Stu, good to see you. I do have a timer on me, but uh, I'll be very uh, liberal, I should say. So anyway, so what we'll do is uh, for those who RSVP'd, we're, we're going to start with uh, in the order in which I received your RSVP. So feel free to come up and give your two cents in roughly three minutes. So, And seeing as though we, we don't have too many folks who RSVP'd, I, I figured um, it doesn't hurt if, you know, to do a Q&A, if, if you wish, you know, after your presentation. So we'll kind of play it by ear as we go along. So thank you very much. So our first presenter tonight is, drumroll. <laughs> Andrew Primlani, please step forward. Thank you. Members of Solar Washington, <clears throat> I appreciate your invitation and I appreciate this opportunity to tell you what I've been thinking about and working on and dreaming about until something materializes. As you know, when you sometimes are working on some patents, you wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning and say, oh, I could do this, I could do that. Well. Um, I'll, I'll refer to two U.S. patents that are directly connected with solar energy. The patents uh, employ aerial stations or high-altitude land systems that yield large amounts of hydrogen and clean water from rain clouds with solar energy. Airships filled with pressurized helium are suitable to support tons of equipment. A gas reactor per another U.S. patent, one of my U.S. patents, fired with hydrogen can produce large volumes of a working fluid to fill hot air balloons and provide lift and maneuverability of the aerial station. Low ambient temperatures, about minus 50 degrees Fahrenheit, and about 150% insulation, which is the sun is shining on the, on the surface, because of the absence of 
dust, moisture, and no cloud shadings are very favorable conditions for using Stirling engines and Stirling cryo engines to produce electrical power, liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen, and liquid nitrogen. A network of aerial stations can provide any area of the earth with energy, clean water, aerial computer cloud and communications. The proposal addresses a single and complete answer to solve the climate change damaging effects and means to replace other sources of energy including coal-fired plants, nuclear plants, and failing hydro dams. Now this is very brief and it's kind of abbreviated and it's cut short. Uh, in its full presentation it would be about 20 pages long, so a lot of calculations. So since I've left a very kind of a sketchy skeleton of what this is about, I'd be glad to answer any questions. Or oh, this thing? Uh, no. Um, can you put this on the screen now? Oh, oh. Well, you know, I can uh, certainly uh, put it on email and and send it to you, and then it'll then you got it. Oh yeah, I got the patent numbers. The the, the, the solar patent is seven eight nine one one eight six. Now I, I I have thirty copies over there. Uh, the young lady over there has it. She could, if, if you don't mind, can you kind of sort them out? And and both the patent numbers are mentioned there. Yeah, you, you could get them on Google. Go ahead and try that, 7891186. It, it shows a, quite a variety of applications. It's under the USPTO website, US Patent and Trademark Office. That, that's 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 one of them. Um, no, the this one is uh, on automobiles. Waste waste. Well, to try, did you get seven eight nine one one eight six? Seven eight nine one one eight six. Oh, you know, I I may have. Yeah, that's what you've got. Such a method of waste heat recovery. This this is a a different patent that uh, for waste heat from recovery from automobiles. Um, yeah, open up anyone you want. There's about six of them. Okay. Okay, power, power generating systems. That might, that might. Well, briefly, um, I, 
I probably put the wrong patent number here because I got several of them. But um, I could email Patrick with uh, the whole patent actually. And it, it, it shows uh, about 10 different applications of solar power, aerial, aerial systems, solar powered aircraft, drones, there's a lot of things coming in. There, there, there you, yeah, you got it, you got it, that, that's it. If you give them a minute, you can, you can just scroll that, just scroll that now. And you'll see the aerial station. Yeah, that's that. Figure seven. Okay, there, there's one of the aerial stations that I've been talking about. Now, this one is a, is a complete all-inclusive power system including wind, solar, everything. It's all packaged together with a, a combined um, working fluid. They all, they all work together. You, you could use... Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so the next presenter is Martin Nix. And he does have the PowerPoint presentation. So. And I believe he's speaking on uh, solar smelter technology. Is that correct? Okay. Keep going. Uh, can I see his microphone? Okay. Hi, I'm uh, Martin Nix, and I am founding secretary of uh, Solar Washington. I was, uh, it was me, Mike Nelson, Chris Herman. We founded, founded this organization, so I've been long involved in it. I have a few announcements to make. Uh, let's go to the next slide here. Uh, I have long been involved in solar cooking technology. I have two patents. Uh, go to the next one. Uh, this one here is actually a solar wedge. And it's actually made up of a solar washer sign, you know. So <laughs> uh, I've been active with Solar Cookies International, and I'm proud to say that our Solar Cookies International is an organization. I want everybody to join it because they're really doing a knockout job in refugee relief. Um, go on to the next one. I am pleased to announce that I have been awarded a patent from the U.S. Patent Office of a solar powered smelter. It melts rocks and glass. And uh, basically, uh, it's made a go to the next one, please. Uh, basically, it's a planar reflector with a half-shell parabolic, and it focuses the sun's rays into a hole in the ground. Low center of gravity in mass production, it should be about as expensive as a bicycle. In other words, I can cook up a glass, recipe of glass, rocks, metals, you know. You know I can do something more than solar cooked turkeys. You know? <laughs> uh, it can be any size. Uh, this right here is a very original one, and it's real small. This came off a 3D printer. Uh, we've got a group of engineers working here. It's a planar reflector. This here will catch a piece of paper on fire. And uh, keep going, next one. Uh, I have another one version. This here was actually going to the next one. This is a solar powered smelter with no moving parts whatsoever. This was actually used by ancient Incas and Egyptians to melt rocks. This is an old design. I'm, I'm thrilled to say that I've invented it. The archaeologist called me up and said, hey, look, we're, we're, we're finding these things all over the world. Uh, so that's amazing. Oh, you can see, see them down there. Uh, this right here, I'm also proud to say the U.S. Patent Office is awarding this one to me this week. Uh, this is a, another version of the solar smelter. It has a curved overhang, keep rain off of it. It has a heliostat, uh, which floats on the turntable. Uh, and uh, it also makes hot air and steam. Go to the next one, please. And there's another view of it. Uh, go next. Another view. Another view. Another view. Go on, turn. Keep going. Okay. Uh, we can make it. Notice there are heat pipes in there to make steam. Uh, keep going. What's unique about it is I use an airbag and it floats in oil. Uh, this is a new type of heliostat, so uh, different design. Keep going. And uh, that's a frontal view of it. It floats in oil. 
uh, as a turntable would just keep going. And uh, basically what I envision is a factory turns out one every second. <laughs> Dream on, Martin. <laughs> I'm trying to find the venture capital, but basically what you do, you make kits, and then the kits are put in the shipping container, you ship it to Afghanistan, and Afghanistan make the bricks locally. You can literally make this thing out of adobe brick, dirt cheap. And it brings industrial process heat to people around the world. Keep going. Uh, other versions of it, there's a tiltable version here, keep going. Uh, you, if you add a windmill to it, you can make heat in, in the winter time. Just tilt the planar reflector up. Now here's what's unique about this is that uh, uh, you can make AC electrical power. Alternating current electricity at nighttime, base load, 24 hours a day from solar thermal. And personally, I think it would be cheaper than solar photovoltaics. Uh, keep going. And so I'm going to make a prediction here. I personally think the biggest market for solar smelters is going to be water pumping. Uh, and I think there's a solution to global warming. And I want to go into helio-hydroelectric technology here real quickly. Uh, basically, the invention of solar-powered pumps uh, down, allows us to pump seawater. Go to the next slide. Allows us to pump seawater inland to the middle of deserts to make it make artificial rain. Basically, this concept is real simple. Basically, solar-powered pumps pump seawater inland to deserts, like Sahara Desert. It creates an inland lake. Sunlight hits the inland lake, creates clouds. Clouds run up against the mountains. Mountains create rain. Rain creates in amount of vegetation in deserts, which removes carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And I'm talking about building these things in places like Egypt, Algeria, Iran, Syria, Iraq, uh, Libya, you know, places where everybody's fighting. You know, you ever notice how where they're fighting there's a drought going on? Try Texas, you know. I mean, um, this is the solution. And uh, I'm going to ask everybody to please start talking about helio hydroelectric power because I'm trying to get a straight answer out of Jay Inslee. You know, you know Patty Murray knows about it, President Obama knows about this. Um, you know, our local venture capitalists, Billionaires Club, know about this. No one's talking about it. News media is not even talking about it. Helio hydroelectric technology means the use of solar energy to create hydroelectric power. You could use this technology to create rainfall and put more of it in Colorado and Rio Grande and solve the drought problem. Now, the key to this is development of a low-cost solar-powered pumps. In my opinion, the use, the invention of the solar smelter, integrated with wind turbines and with wind chimneys and stuff. Uh, I have drastically reduced the cost of water pumping and makes this technologically feasible. And personally, I don't see any more visionary what the 19, 1920s was for, uh, shall we say, uh, building the hydroelectric dams in Tennessee. Uh, except now, you know, we're trying to solve a global warming problem. So keep going. Uh, there are different types of methods of helio. I can get into real details on this, but keep going. Uh, you make you can, it, you can make get grow algae to make diesel fuel. You can extract rare metals from it. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of really interesting stuff about it. Uh, keep going. And you can also integrate, integrate geothermal energy with it. I can get into that a little bit more. Uh, keep going. And then this is actually ancient technology back in, uh, in uh, Somalia. They used to build buried pyramids and condense water from the atmosphere in $50,000 a gallon. So this is really ancient technology. It's been around for decades. You know, and I, I've rediscovered it. I have 10 patents now in this field. And uh, the patent office has been really helping out. I'm requesting assistance from Sandia Labs, uh, technical analysis on it. So uh, if you get people to talk it up, you know, contact your local electric officials and ask them what is going on with helio hydroelectric. Why why is nobody talking about this? And uh, you know, including, uh, you know, I, I'm trying to get climate solutions even talk about it. You know, so uh, keep going. Uh, so anyway, I'm making a claim here. I'm saying that uh, solar smelter technology can make alternating. Uh, electrical current, base load, 24 hours, even night in wintertime, and I say you can make it cheaper than PVs, photovoltaics. I'm also saying you make heat cheaper than natural gas. And uh, it, what I'm doing here is bringing industrial process heat, the surface temperature of the sun, to the common man. You can build these things out of Adobe brick, dirt cheap. And uh, so what I've done here is I have invented uh, an entire new field, and this is a low-cost industrial process heat. And uh, so. Anyway, uh, spread the word, and thank you very much for listening to what I have to say. Keep going. Uh, additional information on our webpage, solarsmeltersinternational.org, Sunbushin, which is our vision of what a for-profit manufacturing firm will look at. I'm also associated with Solar Cookers International. And uh, keep going. Thank you.
And the next one, Louise Petruzzella. Talking about Shoreline's clean tech program. Okay. Petruzzella. Thank you, Patrick, and thank you, Solar Washington, for hosting this meeting tonight. Uh, we're thrilled to be here. Uh, about seven or eight years ago, Mike Nelson started the program at Shoreline Community College, and uh, the emphasis has definitely been on photovoltaics and uh, solar energy. There are two options for students at Solar, uh, I'm sorry, at Shoreline Community College. We do offer a certificate of proficiency at 45 credits. We also offer a two-year diploma in applied associates uh, at 93 to 95 credits. I am a graduate of the program. My name is Louise Petrozella. Wendy is a graduate of the program. These fine people will be graduates of the program. Uh, and we are thrilled to be serving the community at large now. This summer, I'm facilitating a practicum class. And we've taken two community projects on. My students are involved in hands-on assessment, site analysis, and design. One in off-grid application, which Lucas will talk about, and one grid-tied application, which is a collaboration with North Seattle Community College uh, for an installation on the educational building, I think. Uh, it will be in a great view off of the five and should be a, a nice, nice system. So, with that, this is Vivian also. She's part of the program. I'm going to turn it over to Lucas first. He'll talk about the urban farm project in the community. And then CJ will pick up and talk more about the North Seattle Red Tide project. Thank you. So what the heck are we doing at summer school? Um, right now we're doing an urban farm project, which is actually uh, there's a steward of a city lot in central Seattle. Um, he's not allowed to bring any electrical energy in from the city, so he's asked us to develop a uh, solar array um, and any other means of sustainable energy to help him uh, grow plants uh, full season, summer and winter. He's building a greenhouse. Um, he wants to have heat mats for plants and heat lights for plants through the winter. Um, this is an off-grid system, completely off-grid, batteries, um, you know, everything. Uh, he has some trouble with uh, some shading issues. We're going to have to work around that. And, you know, aside from solar, we're going to see if we can develop some sort of uh, alternative energy as far as maybe wind power or a generator system that uh, uses biodiesel as well. Um, so together, I mean, as a class, as a, as a student body, uh, we're fine-tuning our skills with real projects in the community, for the community. And to echo, uh, to echo Lucas, um, this project with North Seattle Community is also uh, is something I'm proud of as well as the team. Since we'll be working with other students and spreading the word of solar power. Um, they have already had an initial assessment with AR Solar and we're going to pick up from there. 15 to 20 kilowatt system for their uh, instructional building roof. Like, um, and it's going to be great practice. I'm excited to be doing that because uh, it's a little more real than working at my own house. And uh, we're going to be learning all the uh, safety and everything else. It's been it's going to be good. So, yeah. Thank you. Just a couple closing comments. I did bring uh, an outline of coursework for the program. I also brought a little pamphlet. You can find it on the table here. And certainly, we invite you to take some courses uh, for fun. Uh, we invite you to take the whole program and continue the work of uh, solar energy. I'm available for questions. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys, very much. Um, the next uh, person, uh, Scott Pride, who uh, emailed me, but I wasn't sure if Scott was going to show up just based on the nature of his email. So it sounds like Scott's, it looks like Scott's not here because nobody's getting up and walking up. And the next presenter, uh, Tui. 
We do have one. Okay, great. My name is Tui Fukimoana. Just call me Tui. I'm from the island of Tonga in the South Pacific. And tonight I'd like to tell you something completely different from what you heard because um, this is a wide, huge market for solar energy, the whole South Pacific region. If you had a chance to look at the map of the Pacific Island, you start from Hawaii in the north to New Zealand in the south and to Easter Island on the east, you will find in that triangle, you find Marquis Island, Hawaii, Tahiti, and Niue, Tonga, New Zealand, and uh, the Pitcairn Island. All those islands belong to Polynesian race. They are husky, light brown skinned people. This is include Tonga, where I come from, and Samoa. And on the top left corner on the Pacific map, you will find Guam, Palau, Gosarai, you name many, many islands over there. They are small people with straight hair, with dark skin. They are Micronesian race. And further down on the Pacific map, you'll find Papua New Guinea, New Caledonia, Vanuatu, and many, many islands with Solomon Islands, New Hebrides, New Caledonia. Those islands, they belong to Melanesian race. They are tall people, dark skin with wiry hair. They are Melanesian. So Polynesian people, where Tonga locates, is the most handsome in these three races. <laughs> you can imagine there are thousands and thousands of islands in this area. But Bua New Guinea is one of the wealthiest islands in the Pacific, speak about 700 languages. The entire Pacific speak about 5,000 different languages. And I'm telling you this from Tonga, where I come from, um, consists of 172 islands, only 36 occupied. And I was a high school teacher there, I know nothing about solar power, and I made a mistake. I married with a Peace Corps girl from Ohio in 1974. And I left Tonga in 1974, and I lived at east of Novelty Hill, east of Redmond. I lived there for 30 years. And after 12 years, I went back to Tonga, because I owned properties, close to the beach because I didn't go there within the 12 years because I, I figured out there won't, there won't be no development in the island. I was so shocked seeing the Chinese people and people from Asia, they dominate the Pacific. When I left in 1974 from Tonga, there were only three major power that controlled the entire Pacific. First, US, UK, and France. And at the end of Cold War in, 18, in 1980s, Britain moved back, America just totally ignored the Pacific, and France is just on and off. What happened, the Asian country moved in, and today, I'm telling you, they are taking over most of the Pacific region, especially South Pacific. And then I went there and built a, I owned a small bed and breakfast in Tonga in 1995, and from 95 to 2000, I complete my place, and I see the, the, the fast growing of the Chinese business in the island. It made me upset first. I met at the royal family who ruled the country. So I came back in 2000. I worked with the guy who is the uh, director of Pacific Island Development at East West Center in Honolulu. I taught him in high school, and he's, uh, he got his PhD from England in economics. So I said to him, why don't you quit your job? Let's start to go back to Tonga and do a reform for a new reform political government. We did. In 2010, he was in the parliament. He's the leader now in the democratic movement. And uh, I told him my next step, I'm going to try to find out uh, to help the, the Tonga for solar energy. So that's how I started it. Um, and then uh, I started a small company. I'm still working on it. It's called South Pacific Economic Resources. I am the CEO. And um, my mission is to provide information on potential market outlets and advice on how to approach these opportunities to some of the, some of the central South Pacific islands. There are two ways I'm working on. 
First, I'm going to tell to the business people here about opportunities in the Pacific, especially the South Pacific, tourism, development, agriculture. Uh, mainly, I'm working on the, the solar energy. And my uh, second part of my program, I have to, I'm going in September and reno renovate part of my building to open a, a small office. And that office is to do research on solar project, on government solar project. And once we wrap up a uh, development, and then I can contact with the solar company here to, to do the job. These islands they have very small economies, but they have a huge millions of dollars from international donors. And then New Zealand and some other countries, they fed up with the corruption in the past 30 years of giving money and the government mis misused it. So today they are starting a new method of make the aids more effective. So what happened, let the, each island government bring them the project in solar energy, then they will send their companies to go and build it. America is one of them, and America, I learned in some information from Washington, D.C., they are working right now towards that. They're gonna, they will bring the government ambassador from 16 island nations to Washington, D.C., and then they will review their project, and the government will fund it from here. So, and that's, that's the way I'm working on it. And my vision on my project is to create jobs here and to ensure that the village people in the islands, they are benefit of all aids. To make sure that the development aids make it effective. The other thing I like to see, that I want the American business to return back and engage in the Pacific and to compete with Asian business because American business is still open. They are more openness. They are more play by the rule. They are transparent and they, and they are uh, emphasis and focus on democratic values. That's why I encourage American people to move, to do all kinds of, of um, solar energy project. And while I'm forming my company here, I have a friend from the parliament ask me if I can find, they are working to put together a, it's called a cargo shipping, a cargo passenger sailing uh, trial tri It is a, it's a boat for say, taking cargo and people to the Northern Islands. And this is what they want me to do. They want to find a solar company they can provide a freezer for the boat and a, a, a solar power to power their radio and their stove and their cell phone and many others. And, and he said to me, if you success on finding a solar company in Seattle to provide this for this boat, you multiply by thousand times because this is our economic development next year with the international fund. And this is my dream. And this, I thank you for letting me share my story with you. Thank you. Is uh, Brian Rusk here tonight? Okay. Um, before we get to our final speaker, Linda, um, we, we, Linda will be our final speaker, which means we do have extra time. So um, if anybody after Linda speaks would like to, on an impromptu basis, come up here and give a talk uh, within you know, three to five minutes, feel free, think about it. But um, I'll go ahead and let Linda Irvine come up here from Northwest Sea. Thank you. Hi. Uh, well, thanks for so many people coming out on a wonderful summer evening when we could just be relaxing with a beer already. Um, we've heard some really wonderful visions, and I'm going to bring it down way small and bureaucratic and kind of like, oh, that's not very exciting, but it actually is exciting. So I'm going to tell you what happened who to thank, and what happens next on a very specific topic, which is the Washington State Building Code emergency rule that went into effect on July 1st, uh, yesterday. So the um, thanks to uh, folks like Dave Cozen and Jeff Randall and other Solar Washington members, uh, they got together with WSU's Gary Nordine from the state um, the WSU Energy Extension, and folks from Northwest Seed, uh, my colleague Mia Devine, and they said, we need to help 
solar installers get building permits more easily. There's many places in the state where it's relatively easy to get a building permit, but there are other jurisdictions where they say, oh, you need engineering for this system and you'll need a, a PE stamp and that's going to be an extra $2,000 to go get that stamp. So we said, what could we do to improve the and streamline the process and cut out the red tape? And um, so these wonderful solar installers and solar industry experts put their heads together and came up with a checklist. And they said, if your system meets these criteria, for instance, um, there's no, it weighs no more than four pounds per square foot. Um, it's no more than 18 inches above the surface of the roof on which it is installed, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you automatically qualify for a building permit without any engineering. And they took this before the Washington uh, Building Code Council, and lo and behold, the Building Code Council agreed that this was a great idea, and in fact, it was so important that we needed to put it into effect immediately through an emergency rule. So on June 13th, they adopted the emergency rule. It went into effect on July 1st. Yay! Thank you to Dave and uh, other Solar Washington members who helped by attending the, the technical advisory group meetings and also um, the final Building Code Council meeting where they adopted this rule. So what happens next? Uh, as many solar installers probably know, it's one thing to have a rule. It's another thing to make sure that all the building officials in the state, in all the faraway pockets of Washington, know that rule and actually abide by it. So the next step in the process is that Gary Nordine, Mia Devine, uh, hopefully Dave, and um, any, uh, anyone else who's interested from the solar industry is welcome to we're going to convene a meeting where we come up with a packet of information to send to these building officials and also to put online so that if a solar installer encounters a problem, they can go online and download the official letter from the WSU uh, Energy Extension Office saying, this is the intent of the rule, here's what it means, here's the checklist that you can adopt so that you can ensure that uh, you as a jurisdiction are following the rule. So uh, that's my most exciting thing in solar in Washington in the past month. Say. Um, and I really appreciate all the big, big dreams, but this is like a small little thing. And one good note, I already got a message from Josh Miller of Western Solar that he had applied to, uh, for a building permit in Anacortes on July 1st because he knew the rule had gone into effect. And they said, oh, no, you're going to need engineering on that. And he said, no, I'm not. And they said, yes, you are. And uh, he called and we got him in touch with Gary Nordine, and Gary Nordine called the building official, and the next thing Josh knew, he got a phone call from the building official and said, oh, you're right, you don't need engineering. So, yay. Um, a victory for solar in Washington. One, two, three, yeah, wonderful. Uh, do you know about the situation in Kenmore? Uh, a, a Solar Washington member called Patrick O'Brien was ordered to take his photovoltaic system off his roof. It was actually carport. And uh, I have yet to figure out why the city, because it was a working system for like several years. I've only heard sort of the, 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 the smoke, but I don't know the, the actual details of that. But he, he filed in state court on it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, but this is a real problem. We've got some people out there just for vindictive reasons. That, they see somebody putting the solar system and say, I'll make you take it down because I happen to be a turning, turning for the city or something like that. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, we do have a real problem with uh, uh, local governments uh, trying to sabotage the state intent. And I, I do think it's a, it's a long process of building relationships one by one with those different people. So sort of carrot and stick, um, showing them that it's good for business if they make it easy to install standard solar systems in their territory. I mean, they're going to have more building construction activity if they make it easy. So there's ways that we would like to get engaged and work with them on that. But I'll, I'll have to look into those details more to understand fully that particular case. I saw a question in the back. Um, I'm sure installers could give you lots of, I mean, there's, there's issues with um, the electrical permits sometimes. Uh, how many times do they come back and inspect it? In, issues with inspection, I know there's, I mean, how technical do you want to get? I'm, I'm not super technical, but there's like lines. Okay, yeah. Um, 
so there's issues with the utility. Um, different utilities make it more or less difficult to sign their interconnection agreements. Do they require you to do a study of impacts to the grid before you connect? We hope not, but at you know, it's, at, once you reach a certain penetration level, they do have the right to ask that of you, and that would be um, a huge hurdle if, if, in fact, you were asked to do that. So uh, I think for the most part, the, the, the red tape that we're looking at, it's not so much that there's, that there's red tape, it's that the red tape is different everywhere, and it's unpredictable, and it's not consistently enforced. So if we at least had certainty of what was required and what the process was, I think it would make it a lot easier to do business across the state of Washington and not have to worry about every time I go to a, a city where I've never um, worked before, I'm going to have to learn a whole new system of how to apply for the permits and things like that. Okay. Just a quick question. Um, how do I um, send my technical information? It's highly tech technical, calculations and proofs and everything. Uh, I've sent it to the Department of Energy. They, they are reviewing it. I've sent it to the governor's office. Uh, I, I sent to the state representative. And I get the same answer. We are reviewing it now. They're, they're reviewing it. And I think it's kind of a dead end. I don't know the answer. Does the guy around here who's in Lincoln learn of that? Because he looks at the yeah. ideas and he'll buy it. Right? Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you, Linda. Appreciate that. Okay, so that, that is the end of the list of folks who RSVP'd. Um, we do have time, additional time. Anybody want to take this opportunity to come up here and say what's ever on your mind vis-a-vis -vis solar? Um, this is your chance. Do I have any takers? <laughs> if not, no worries. You want to go ahead? Okay. But I, but I like this, the opportunity for myself and other people to ask questions of the people that made presentations because we have time. Um, just because I, you know, anytime you get a room full of people, there's different people with different connections, and sometimes you can help each other. Um, so, like, you know, the first question I that jumped into my mind when we looked at um, solar furnaces and solar smelters and solar cookers is. Have you talked to Shelterbox? Do you know who Shelterbox is? And have you talked with them? There are so many people out there that uh, um, everybody says you should talk to. My biggest problem is getting their attention. You know, I mean, how many people have told me to go talk to Bill Gates? <laughs> um, I can tell you this much. I knew him back in Albuquerque, and he's aware of what I'm doing, and he, he will not support me. Uh, so uh, my impression is a lot of the companies out there who are in the same situation as I am, uh, we're looking for the capital investment, and there just isn't enough of it out there. Um, for and According to Casey Golden, who's on the board of the Climate Solutions, he says for every 500 ideas, he can only find like one. So there, there is a shortage of capital investment for uh, new ideas. And uh, also, I would also add, there's also a lot of predatorial practices going on. I've seen so many people get me side, try to sign away my patent rights, and their intent is to suppress the technology. Makes a good point. Anybody else have any questions uh, for those who spoke earlier or not? Okay. 
So um, on that, do you have, do you have a, do you want to? Statement, statement, comments, questions, all accepted. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Bob Ransom. I'm on the board of directors here. Uh, I'm not a technician in this field at all. I'm a human resource director that then went into politics. And I'm in local politics. And as mayor of the city of Shoreline, I put on 117 solar panels on our garage. We have 200 more that we'd like to put on the roof and another 100 on the, garage, on the north side of the garage. I'm also now the elected commissioner of Ronald Wastewater, which is the Shoreline Citywide Sewer District with 16,500 connections and a $15 million budget. And I'm meeting Tuesday with both David Nickel, who is one of the board members here, who is championing the idea of community-sponsored uh, solar panels uh, with a community investment program. And the only catch on that is because it's an eight-year, they get the tax write-off and so forth, there's a commitment that they uh, have the lease of the roofs or whatever you're putting it on for an eight-year period, which creates some problems because if anybody's talking about selling a particular building, then they won't do it because uh, they won't get their full eight years and th there's complications and political wars. The other is Larry Owens, who you may know. He used to teach at Shoreline Community College along with Mike Nelson. And he has a grant program from the state. And I know that the city of Olympia, with 13000 of their money and 187000 from this grant program, was able to put on a lot of solar panels on their city. And there's various other cities have gotten different amounts. The highest one was $550,000 that one jurisdiction got. And I think that's the absolute most you can get. But it really raises some questions. Okay, now government can move forward. And I'm trying to get City of Shoreline to use the grant program to put on a couple hundred more uh, solar panels on the city. And the Ronald Wastewater District, there's 120 panels that we would like to put on the, on the garages. And I'm bringing Larry Owens in to speak on that topic on Tuesday, hoping to get then an approval of the, of the board to put on the 120 panels on our garages for the wastewater district. So uh, there are things going on out there, and now it's looking very good for government in entities to get into the state program and get on solar panels. So I thought you should at least know about these things. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Appreciate that. Anybody else have any questions or comments or anything they would like to share tonight before we wrap it up? Stu. Um, this one's solar related, which is just a reminder that next month at Shoreline Community College is Solar Fest um, or Northwest Solar Fest. So hopefully folks will show up there. Um, one of the things I'm also trying to do is um, there's a a uh, documentary that came out about a month or so ago called Momenta. Um, it was screened up in Bellingham. It was screened here in Seattle and across the Northwest. Um, it's about the coal train issues facing the Northwest. iTech Energy is in it. Silicon Energy is in it, um, along with different stakeholders across the area. And there's going to be a screening of it on the 26th of July at Solar Fest. We're trying to figure out exactly what time, but um, it's a pretty nice movie that talks about a very important climate change issue. Um, it talks about the coal trains and then it talks about solar wind as far as being part of the solution to this huge global problem. So just hope folks will remember to go to Solar Fest and if you have some time check out a really cool movie. Thanks Stu. Anyone else? I thought we should add that at our last board meeting, it was moved by myself, Robert Ransom, that the Solar Washington Board of Directors approve uh, sponsorship of the Shoreline Solar Fest at the $2,500 level with an additional $2,500 set aside for display and tents and for our booth 
uh, at the festival. And the motion was seconded by Linda Irving here and was and passed by the whole board at our June meeting on June 17th. So. Thank you for mentioning that. Appreciate it. How many here are going to SolarFest? All right. Anybody else? I, I just want to say thank you to everybody here because uh, being one of the founders of this organization, it just it was just like ten of us got together in a, in, out there in a coffee shop and said we're going to form an organization. I'm just amazed at how everybody keeps at it. Wonderful. Thanks a lot, guys. You know. You are welcome. Thank you. Anybody else? So we're going to continue having the meetings here for the time being. The next one's uh, September 2. I don't know when Labor Day is, but I hope it's far away from September 2. Let's just put it that way. Is that on a Tuesday? Su suffice it to say that we have this place first Wednesdays of every odd month. OK, the third. OK, I'll check my calendar. So um, meeting topic to be determined. Check out our emails. I know you're getting our emails. Do we have a meeting topic uh, confirmed? We're, we're still working on that. Um, but you know, thank you all for coming tonight. As you all know, we are a nonprofit organization. We are trying to do our best to help serve, uh, in so many ways, the industry as well as the public to educate the public about solar energy use. So if you have any comments, if you have any suggestions about what Solar Washington can do, how we can improve what we do, let us know, because we really appreciate your feedback. So as of that, we've gone one hour. Uh, feel free to hang out here. We have this place until 8 o'clock. But thank you all very much for coming tonight. We really appreciate it. Thank you.